things will move in the right direction. We'll always see advances in technology, more capital going in, you know, great stories about things. That's all fine, but it can be distracting unless we step back and remember that it's not about the fact that we're making progress. Obviously, we're making progress. The question is, is it fast enough? Welcome to Climate Positive, a podcast produced by Hannon Armstrong, a leading investor in climate solutions. I'm Chad Reed. I'm Hillary Langer. I'm Gil Jenkins. In this series, we host candid conversations with the leaders, innovators, and changemakers driving our climate positive future. The recent meteoric rise of ESG or sustainable investing is both compelling and undeniable. Today, more than 3,500 asset managers and related organizations representing more than $120 trillion in assets under management subscribe to the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, or PRI, which are a set of voluntary and aspirational principles that encourage the incorporation of ESG factors into investment decisions. But as more and more professional investors publicly proclaim their ESG and sustainability bona fides, real questions persist as to both their sincerity and their actual impact on the pressing social and environmental challenges of our day, most notably climate change. Tariq Fancy served as the first Chief Investment Officer for Sustainable Investing at BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager. But since leaving the firm, he has become a prominent critic of the efficacy of ESG investing and the greenwashing efforts of many investment firms, and a strong proponent of policy solutions to address climate change. In this episode, Jeff Eckel and I dive deep with Tariq into the heart of ESG investing and the sustainable capitalism movement. We also speak with Tariq about the mission and initiatives of the education technology nonprofit he now leads, Rumi. We hope you find this discussion as insightful and thought-provoking as we did. Tariq, many thanks for joining us today here at Climate Positive. Thanks for having me on. Well, we always begin our episodes with a discussion of our guests' individual journey into the climate space. So, Tariq, you were born and raised in Toronto, Canada, and you initially pursued a career in investment banking in Silicon Valley and then private equity in New York. Why banking and private equity to start your career? I think I'm probably like a lot of folks who I just graduated at the end of undergrad and wasn't totally sure what to do next. I'd set my sights on winning a big scholarship post-undergrad that I missed in the final round. And so I just kind of followed folks that I knew who seemed to be sort of, you know, a lot of smart kids are going in a direction of banking, consulting, and I had no idea what to do. And that that's kind of how it all started. I used to be kind of a coder. I did a lot of tech internships and programming. And so I decided to do tech banking as sort of uh, merging the two interests or disciplines. And that was during the heady days leading up to the financial crisis. So what were the dynamics in the industry like at that period of time? Well, it's interesting. I took the offer to go into banking in 2000 and then actually joined in 2001. This is why, as you can imagine, tech banking seemed really attractive because I kind of like ended up accepting an offer around the peak. And then, as I say, I, I didn't catch the party. I caught the hangover for the most part. And then that led to me actually switching into distressed investing. One of our clients was a buy side private equity firm working in the space. I, again, I had no particular deep passion for it, but it, I got along really well with uh, those folks. And, and so I joined them out of the investment bank. And that really gave me a crash course in understanding how markets work and you know how you can have a lot of hype that is unsustainable and you know sort of being able to differentiate from the winners and the losers when the, the tide goes out and the capital isn't as easy to get. And so then it gave me kind of a look into what then became the financial crisis. And in 2007, we raised a, a three and a half billion dollar fund with a goal of saying, you know, we didn't know exactly when things would crash or, or what would happen, but we uh, knew that it was unsustainable and that something was going to have to change. And so that was sort of our process and, and looking at it and sort of understanding that there was likely to be some kind of a crisis or downturn. What a fantastic way to get trained to go through a crisis. I always think our best employees have been through one company blow up, hopefully two, that they didn't start. And then you end up just learning so much more. When everything goes up, eh, you're not learning that much. Absolutely. After the crisis or, or during the crisis, Tariq, I believe you joined the Canada Private Pension Investment Board, where you helped build new investment strategies and expand the investment platform. Can you tell us about the cultural differences between investment banking, private equity in the U.S. versus pension fund investing in Canada? Well, there's definitely a difference. It's actually in some ways less than some folks would think because a lot of the Canadian pension plans actually 
unlike the American ones, started to build in-house investment capabilities, and in, including in private equity and private investments. So I was hired as part of that wave. They were looking for you know people who were Canadians who would be open and working in Toronto, but had you know built their experience in the U.S. And I, for a bunch of reasons, including family reasons, wanted to you know I'd been gone for close to a decade and a half, and so I wanted to to come back and it, it fit really well. And so uh, it is different. Um, but that being said, you know, they, they weren't as aggressive for sure as the, the New York vulture investor fund that I worked with, but also were willing to be creative and had the advantage of having lots of capital and the ability to be long-term and patient, which, you know, the right investments can, can work really well. And then shortly thereafter, you left finance and investing just as you were entering your prime earning years to found and lead Rumi which is an education technology nonprofit seeking to bring free digital learning to those on the wrong side of the digital divide. What did your finance friends say when you decided to make this uh, pretty big career shift? You know, for the most part, they didn't understand it. It was like I was jumping off a building and they thought like, you're sort of in this amazing place. Why would you do it now? And for me, it was really a personal decision. I I had worked on investments some years earlier to bring both basic mobile phones into emerging markets. My parents were born and raised in Kenya, and my brother was even born there before immigrating to to Canada uh, just before I was born. And so I had always had a sense for the disparities, had a deep interest in international development. And having worked on bringing mobile phones into emerging markets, saw the power of a leapfrog innovation, where you go to a community where they don't even have the basic thing, in that case, landlines, and they go straight to the latest, best technology it's sort of a watershed moment in international development. And Rumi was based on a similar idea that as mobile phones not just proliferate, but people get smartphones and they get slightly better ones, you have this ability to bring the free digital learning revolution to the offline world, right? If you think about it, you know, in the last 20 years, everything we've learned has become free in some form online. And uh, I had this idea, it was an echo of the mobile phone idea that I'd worked on. And I was passionate about the idea of Rumi. I needed a bit of a push. And that came because my business school roommate, he and I both had had this passion that we wanted to do something with, with frankly, social purpose behind it at some point in our lives. And then we graduated and went back to finance. And then he, a few years after we graduated, contracted stage four cancer. And it was stage four melanoma. And so at that point, it's less a matter of your chances and more, unfortunately, a matter of time. And while he was fighting stage four cancer, he, um, this is a blonde haired blue eyed Dutch guy, went to Kenya. And so I helped advise him and help him think through the, the ideas and, and connect with some of the family connections and all. And I saw him firsthand fighting stage four cancer for two and a half years and realizing that, you know, at that point that it wasn't, you know, someday it was now or never. And, you know, you tend to live these things vicariously through friends. And so he had encouraged me to, to just go for it at some point. And, you know, it kind of all came together and I decided to just go for it by starting Rumi. Eventually, after a few years with Rumi, BlackRock came knocking. BlackRock, the the largest asset management firm in the world, has about $9 trillion uh, in AUM right now, at least. So that's assets under management. And you decided to join them as a managing director and their first ever chief investment officer of sustainable investing. Why? You know, it was really interesting. I, Rumi had reached a point where we had shown a tremendous amount of potential, you know, Harvard Business School, Tarty case study. We had gone through a bunch of, you know, really interesting growth and shown that this this can work, that you can sort of bring free digital learning to some of the most remote parts of the world and, and increasingly even in, in rich countries to address inequalities. And that was fantastic. But, you know, BlackRock at the same time and all of the financial firms are starting to get interested in impact investing for a variety of reasons. And so their approach to me was that, listen, we want someone who understands investing and finance sort of from the ground up, has invested, has built strategies and hired investors and so on. And someone who understands social bottom lines, you know, from the ground up and has has built them and and also used technology to do it. And so I found myself in this position where I'd kind of done both sides of it at a unique moment in time. And that's what led to the conversation starting and eventually deciding to join with the idea that as much as I didn't want to step back from running Rumi day to day at that point, it's the largest asset manager in history, right? And so in, in my head, I thought, well, if we get this right, it can obviously have an extraordinary amount of impact and potentially reforming how capitalism works, you know, not at a micro level, which, you know, at some levels, what we're doing with Rumi, even though the technology scales very rapidly but at a really macro systemic level that we really need at this point. And so that all of that thought process, you know, led me to believe that this is something that I can't 
say no to. It's something that's a really interesting opportunity where we could drive significant change. In your most recent essay, The Diary of a Sustainable Investor, you give a really effective, I believe, basketball analogy explaining what ESG or sustainable investing is. Could you talk us through that? Yeah, definitely. So the essay wrote um, The Secret Diary of a Sustainable Investor. It's in three parts. The first is how the system works. The second is why what I call good sportsmanship can't really save us. And then number three is the danger of the illusion or these fairy tales that we can keep the status quo and achieve all our social goals without it costing us anything. And so in the first part, the basketball analogy is the idea is that competitive markets are a bit like competitive sports, which is to say that you have rules and you have you know referees or regulators who enforce those rules. And within those rules, the goal of the players is to maximize points. So if it's basketball and it's the NBA, you have, you know, they've drawn lines on the court. There's a line behind which shots are worth three points. There's referees to make sure you don't foul people and do this and that. And once all those rules are understood, the players have one goal, right, is to maximize points on the scoreboard. And that's what wins the game. And that structure is important because it allows the players then to understand the guidelines and, and the, you know, the guardrails and then play a competitive game that, you know, suits everyone's interest, including the fans, because it's highly competitive and it's, you know, it, it rewards uh, quality play and, and innovation and, and creativity and teamwork and so on. Capitalism is similar, right? You have, there's this idea of a free market that somehow seems to get bandied about in 2021, even though it makes no sense at all. There is no such thing as a free market, right? Um, ask any lawyer, market is a collection of rules. And those rules, like a competitive sport, govern how the players compete. And in capitalism, those rules and regulations are everything from property taxes to intellectual property rights to fines on pollution and so on. And those govern how companies who are sort of like players on a, on a field or on a court compete. And they are focused on creating profits, right? Their legal and financial structures are built to maximize profits within the rules laid down in the game in front of them. And that's sort of the analogy I use to, to connect the dots between a competitive market and something that everyone kind of gets, which is a competitive sport. And so how does ESG fit into this analogy? The way I'd look at it is even pre-ESG, there's this idea of externalities, right? So since nearly 100 years with this economist, Arthur Pigou, started talking about the idea of externalities. And the idea was that in the pursuit of private profit, firms will sometimes do something that creates a cost or a benefit to society at the same time. So if you do something great and you create infrastructure or a bridge or whatever, even if people have to, to pay, in many cases, they get things that are free or benefits that come out of that, that are a positive externality. A negative externality is easy. It's pollution or something that is created by that process for which society has to bear the costs, even if they had no part in it and didn't get any of the profits. Similarly, in basketball, you know, you might think of a negative externality as like a player who's playing so aggressively that they jump into the sidelines and kick a fan in the face. Clearly, there's a negative externality from their overzealous play and society or the fans bear the cost of that. ESG is, in a sense, a measurement mechanism for a number of things, but at its core, it's being used as a measurement mechanism for externalities, right? So the idea being that a company has good or bad environmental and social performance. For example, they're contributing to global warming or they're not. And that ESG metric is a little bit like measuring good sportsmanship for basketball players, right? In the absence of any rules to allow or disallow specific activity, you can come up with a measure for good sportsmanship. And alongside that, a thesis that has now evolved in markets around ESG that says ESG is great for your long-term returns. And so we can all rely on the market doing it all by itself which is kind of like saying good sportsmanship eventually scores more points on the basketball court. You know, again, implication, well, you know, we can rely on players to be sportsmen like all by themselves because, you know, it's in their own interest to winning the game. And so how did BlackRock approach ESG investing? I think at BlackRock, we took an honest attempt at trying to understand how we could do this within the confines of fiduciary duty. So the idea behind fiduciary duty is this idea that there's a principal agent problem in economics, which is that, you know, the nine and a half trillion under management's not BlackRock's money. It's not Larry Fink's money. It wasn't my money. It is all managed on behalf of clients who are generally, for the most part, it's their retirement savings. 
right? So every single person, all of us included, whether or not we we have trading accounts, people are investing on our behalf, right? Whether it's public pension plans or other things, and even the deposits in our checking account or savings account tend to be used then, you know, to to loan long to to issuers. And so we all have, whether we do it ourselves or not, in our name, someone investing on our behalf. And and so the rules say that you can't focus on social values. You know, you have to focus on dollar values, right? Because everybody has different social values. And the idea is that if you're investing on my behalf, you're legally obligated to focus on return, right? And then to maximize that return. That's how BlackRock works across the board. It's their number one, their first operating principles where, you know, we're fiduciary. Um, and that's all how all the asset managers work. So the idea here is that we were trying to go in there and understand within the confines of what we're doing, which like every other asset manager is really focused on performance and, and maximizing performance and in line with our financial incentives of, of all of the people at the firm, as well as the fiduciary and the legal obligations, we had to figure out a way to do more around ESG. Uh, and that's where I came in and you know started to work on integrating ESG into all of our investment activities globally, as well as look at how we can create new products that align to specifically trying to create, you know, some kind of social impact alongside a financial return. You eventually decided to leave BlackRock, I think only after two or three years. Why? What did you find not meeting your ideals? The time I left, it was, there was a personal thing I had to take care of relating to family business stuff after my father-in-law passed. So I transitioned out over six months, all on, you know, great terms. And I'm still on really good terms with people there. But deep down, I'd started to sort of question what we were doing because it it started to become clear to me that, number one, the thesis underlying all this was incorrect, which is to say that the idea is that good sportsmanship leads to more points, you know, over time. In financial jargon, that's just ESG is good for investing profits, right, investing activities. And what I was seeing across the board from the vantage point I had was that that generally wasn't true, right? I mean... Most of the time, you couldn't really tell if it actually had any value for investing, because frankly, it's hard to measure ESG the way people want to, especially the S gets, you know, the social areas get difficult to measure. And even in so far as you could measure it well, it wasn't clear that it was that useful for return, right? So in other words, I was seeing with a vantage point of the largest asset manager in history, and you know, the biggest pool of assets to capitalism, that being responsible all by yourself right, or sportsmanlike is not necessarily linked to higher returns as a result. And, you know, that was number one. Number two, I, I found there was really no social impact being created out of any of it, right? It seemed to be mostly like what one person called green wishing, right? I mean, it, you, you can sort of say it was a green washing or green wishing, but it certainly seems to be a set of ideas that are hopeful at best. And so that was, you know, the second piece. And then the third piece is we had a bunch of products we were releasing. And for the most part, they seem to have higher fees, but they could not demonstrably show any real world impact. And so in the end, I looked at it and I thought, well, I was bullish about this because I thought if done right, this can create systemic changes and, and reform. And at the end of it, I looked and I saw, I saw, I don't think there's any real world, real world impact re- being created out of any of this, or at least, you know, there's very little, if any. And it seems to be mainly based on a bunch of narratives that don't actually seem to play out in practice, unfortunately. A bunch of alluring, I would say, alluring win-win narratives that we all we all want to believe. I mean, of course, you know, if I can buy a low-carbon ETF and fight climate change at the same time, like that certainly beats the alternative that economists are telling us, which is a carbon tax, right? Because no one wants the one with the word tax in it. But, you know, the reality is that it struck me as being sort of a, a fairy tale that I wanted to believe in. But from what I could see, it wasn't true. Tariq, you and I have had a conversation or two about our investment thesis, which is in a world increasingly defined by climate change, investing on the right side of that climate change line can produce superior risk adjusted returns. And it's a long term thesis, no question. You talk in your article a lot of, about a lot of short termism. We've certainly had to deal with that as a public company. The times I have met with, let's say, the six big banks or at BlackRock, I have to remember to turn off my iPhone bullshit detector so that it doesn't go haywire. And and I continually talk about greenwashing and how nice it would be if it were easy. <laughs> it should, there's simply nothing easy about it. And certainly you've argued for a price on, on carbon, uh, as have we. And yet you also see a lot of progressives 
not trust markets, not trust a price on carbon. Any thoughts on that? I think that, I mean, actually, I think you, you zeroed in on the fundamental, the reason that there's so much urgency around this. It's not just that, you know, obviously the climate threat, which is moving so fast and, you know, where we know an ounce of prevention is preferable to, to a pound of cure. It's actually that the system is producing such suboptimal outcomes today that I would argue it endangers capitalism itself. So today, over 50% of millennials don't believe in capitalism. I don't think that they would fundamentally have distrusted a carbon tax if we had done it at the time Obama was talking about it in the beginning, or you know, really at a time that economists started sort of going on about it. But because we have not actually used the levers that we know are the ones that correct an externality, which is to say, you know, there's a pollution, you have to find people for it. So they have an incentive to do less of it and they find a, you know, a, a cleaner, better way to do it. Because we haven't actually done that, I think that young folks today look at capitalism and they say this system just doesn't work right and so this is the issue they don't i don't think they look at it and think that capitalism can be reformed and it can look like the post world war ii period where you know richard nixon of all people founded the epa they look at it and they think well we don't trust markets at all and that includes a carbon tax and anything else and i i think that it can work but i think that public trust is being eroded over time such that a real market-based solution which is correcting the externality to a tax and then letting the market figure it out is also one they don't trust because they don't trust the market at all because everything they've seen from it you know, seems to be based on a decades-long thesis that tells us since the 80s that free markets solve all problems and wrongly that free markets don't need referees or, or rules or regulations. They just figure themselves out all by themselves, which is clearly not true. And even Friedman and uh, Hayek didn't agree with that, but that has certainly been the narrative that's been sold by business. Absolutely. And, you know, I would argue that that's less based on a great understanding of capitalism or economics. And, and unfortunately, it's just people talking their book. You're not going to solve a long term problem that's 20 years out if you're getting paid in the next few years. Right. The system is going to work the way we should expect it to, which is that people are going to go according to their incentives and they're going to try to, frankly, delay taxes and regulation that are intended to address a long term threat. Because in the near term, marketing and, and lobbying to, to slow that regulation is is how you're going to make more money. So is there an ESG bubble? I don't think that there is a bubble in the sense that I think specific companies that are aligned to addressing the climate threat would actually benefit from greater regulation over time. On the other hand, there are a lot of ESG products that from what I can tell have little to nothing you know, to do with ESG. They just move stuff around and put a new label on it. In that area, there could be because they're really just the same thing you know, with a green label that is getting a higher valuation, even though they're not really aligned with decarbonization or other sort of bigger social trends. I want to move to the topic of policy solutions, because we are talking here today in the midst of two very large bills, a bipartisan infrastructure bill, a, a reconciliation bill, an effort by the Biden administration to potentially institute mandatory ESG-related disclosures. And on that topic, the SEC recently collected comments, and the uh, SEC chief, Gary Gensler, said that the uh, upcoming proposal that the SEC is likely to release will call on businesses to provide qualitative and quantitative information to investors. These could include particulars about how executives manage climate-related risk, as well as more granular details about greenhouse gas emissions and the financial impact of global warming. He also signaled that disclosures may appear in the mandatory filings public companies must make to the SEC. So as the SEC contemplates these sorts of regulations, and the EU has also already made uh, moves in this direction, what do you think are the right policy steps? What disclosures should companies have to make to address the real concerns that we've discussed on greenwashing and other uh, related concerns? So I'd say a few things on that. I think it's important that we have the disclosure of the type that you just mentioned. I don't think that alone is the answer. And that's for a few reasons. I think that under any scenario, investors should be able to access information around their investments that are material you know, to those investments that could have the chance of, of gaining or losing return. And the same way that companies obviously have to disclose their financials and it's audited and so on, because you would obviously need that information in order to decide to invest or not. 
I think that it's important that material ESG information, whether it's climate risks or it's other information in the ESG area, is disclosed and done so cleanly, reasonably regularly, and in standardized format, right? So that it's not what it is now where ESG data is kind of everywhere and there's a lot of ability to massage and cherry pick. So that information is useful. But I would also say two things where I'd add caveats. Number one, the ESG space is so focused on disclosure and data and standards and reporting that they don't actually wonder or ask, does that create any real world impact? Like it may be useful for an investor looking to invest, but disclosing ESG data in and of itself doesn't create real world impact. So think of it this way. Over decades now, companies have been forced to disclose CEO pay and they've done that. And yet, you know, CEO pay has increased relative to the average industry worker. In New York, people disclose calorie counts and all, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily reduced obesity. So transparency in and of itself doesn't correct the problem unless we subscribe to a, an idea that the free market will self-correct. All it needs is the right information. Obviously, faced with a market failure where it's cheaper to burn fossil fuels today than we need for it to be as a society, absent a, a carbon tax or something to correct the externality, That's a problematic thesis because transparency alone just won't get us where we need to go. I think the second point that's really important there is that regulation at the financial services industry is not the same as regulation at the real economy level. Most of the financial sector is going to follow profits, right? I make this joke that like, if drugs all became legal tomorrow, Goldman Sachs would be on the next plane to Mexico to try to get the deal for the Sinaloa cartel's IPO. Right. I mean, literally like the next day and then right after the IPO, they'd probably turn to them and say, hey, you know, now that you're rich, have you met our wealth management division? Right. Now, I don't mean that to like knock Goldman Sachs specifically. I mean, I I worked in the sector. It's just to be honest around how it works. Right. The smart folks, they're competitive and they don't leave money on the table. Right. And that's how the system works. If there's profit to be made, someone will finance it. Right. Which is why I find divestment ridiculous. Right. Because who, who cares if you sell the shares in the fossil fuel company? First of all, someone else will buy them. Second of all, it's not like we're short of examples where, you know, porn is an issue, right? I mean, in society and revenge porn, all these other things, it's not like divesting of porn companies has done anything, right? They're just private. And then they operate with even less scrutiny. So divesting, it doesn't really do anything because the market will always find good opportunities. And obviously being a former distressed or vulture investor, I know that very well. We would look for the opportunities that everyone else ran away from because that's where we knew we could get an outsized return. And so if the market and the system works such that it's efficient, it doesn't leave money on the table and profitable opportunities will find capital, right, which is the way the markets do work and are supposed to work, then I don't think regulating at the financial sector, you know, what level of the ESG grade on your fund is a substitute for saying, wait a second, like if workers are underpaying their employees to the point that like a quarter to half of them need government support to survive, maybe the answer is a minimum wage or something that, you know, corrects the problem at the real economy level. Similarly, you know, with climate change, again, you just need to tax the externality and then let the market figure it out. But unless you do that, unless you make people pay the cost of their pollution, they're going to be polluting more than we want them to. And the system is going to throw more capital in the direction than we want them to. And that's why I think it's really important that all of the talk around ESG reporting doesn't turn into this mess that serves the interests of accounting companies and other ones where the you know you got a whole Byzantine set of new requirements, but they create little to no social impact because they're not accompanied by the rule changes we need. Think of it this way, the sports analogy, this stuff is like saying, you know, hey, we have better ways and more standardized ways to measure good sportsmanship. Hey, that's fantastic. Unfortunately, we're, you know, the game is such that dirty play is winning games today. So measuring good sportsmanship is great, but you still kind of need a referee sitting there saying, Thanks for that measurement. Now I'm penalizing the players who are doing poorly. So Tariq, good sportsmanship in the form of ESG reporting has its flaws. You've been very eloquent on that. We've clearly got unpriced externalities in carbon, although maybe that gets fixed in the next couple of weeks. Who knows? At least uh, in the beginning here in the U.S. What about activism? My friend uh, Andy Karsner was the controversial nominated director for Engine Number 1 to go on Exxon's board. Would any views on how that engagement will work? I am far less optimistic than anyone else about it. Unfortunately, I, I don't want to throw cold water and all the excitement, but the reality is that again, if you look at the structure I've just described, if you put a bunch of different directors on the board of an oil company, and they then now have a fiduciary duty to maximize returns to shareholders, 
it's an oil company, right? I mean, most likely that's going to mean in some way, shape or form, protecting their profit model as long as they can. I think honestly, if any first year investment banking analyst can look at their numbers and figure out pretty quickly that for a company in that situation, what you're probably going to do is to use marketing and lobbying. You know, you're going to obviously say all the right things. I want a carbon tax. It's important. We all need it. You can't be seen as be saying the opposite now, but when they're in the room, their financial incentives are probably going to be to slow it down as long as they possibly can, to water it down so it kicks in years later. It has all kinds of exceptions to certain industries, certain timelines. It's an oil company. Imagine tomorrow if I wanted to do gun control. And I said, hey, you know what? The answer is not outlawing guns, which you know New Zealand and Australia did, or at least having better gun control, which New Zealand and Australia did, and work to prevent mass shootings. The idea is you should put me on the board of a gun company. That's a great idea. Like, what am I going to do when I get there? Tell them to stop selling guns? I mean, at some point, my concern with that is that as a fiduciary, they're forced to maximize returns. And I'm not convinced they can do that much more than another set of directors who also have fiduciary duty, besides maybe having a slightly different view around the urgency of the need for change or other things. And my bigger concern would be that the noise that's created around all of that is so loud that it seems to, and this is what you know some of the research that I've worked on and others done the last few years have shown, is that it actually crowds out the ability of government to intervene. Your points have been very well expressed in your essays. I agree completely. Tom Friedman once talked about the Green Revolution, and he said, you know, I sat in a bathtub in Beirut when there was an actual revolution going on with bullets flying. Revolutions are painful. But you know, not to steal your story, but every time there is a, a good news article, it diminishes the urgency with which serious efforts can get accelerated. It serves as a distraction, right? I mean, if you look at the last five years of ESG stories, I mean, I was in the middle of the machine during a lot of them, and they all sound wonderful and nice, and ESG talk is growing, and ESG reporting and data is growing, and ESG assets are growing, and they're growing alongside carbon emissions and inequality and all of the things that they're meant to address, because for the most part, having seen the mechanics up close, there's no link between the things, right? And so the concern I have is a lot of these stories are just a continuing trend of feel-good things that enable us to think that we're creating systemic reforms. But systemic reforms can't be created on a one-by-one -one basis. I mean, the idea of going, you know, proxy fight by proxy fight, oil company to oil company as a way to fight climate change, I mean, it's ludicrous if you actually stop and think about it. It's like playing whack-a-mole, you know, against the markets with, you know, where there's thousands of moles. Obviously, a systemic reform needs to come from government. And if you have stories like this that I think are heavily oversold, and overhyped, then you run the risk that you actually destroy the political foundation upon which you would build real government reform. Because you're, and again, it's, it's selling people a win-win fantasy. No one wants a carbon tax, right? I mean, let's be honest, like who wants anything with the word tax in it? But we all claim to believe the science. And so somehow we're ignoring that our own experts societally, right? Economists and others are saying, no, no, the only solution is systemic because it has to be led by government. It has to be a carbon tax, it has to be other things like that. Engine number one versus Exxon is a really nice story. I fear that over the long term, it'll be viewed more as a distraction from the real change we need than anything else. I think I generally agree with you. The only aspect that I'm interested in learning more about is the engineering capability of an Exxon or a Chevron. If we're actually going to get serious about carbon capture and storage, which has its justified reservations. But I think in any scenario, we, we do have to uh, sequester carbon. There aren't like spare engineering companies that can solve those uh, deep geological problems. So I'm hopeful that one, there's a profit for oil companies to participate in uh, sequestration of carbon. And I'm hopeful that some activism will help, but uh, Neither of us are very optimistic about uh, any of these things until we get price signals at work. I think that's right. I mean, things will move in the right direction. We'll always see advances in technology, more capital going in, you know, great stories about things. That's all fine, but it can be distracting unless we step back and remember that it's not about the fact that we're making progress. Obviously, we're making progress. The question is, is it fast enough? And we know the numbers that we're not going as fast as we need to, right? And so we need to do something. And I think that has to come as a push at a systemic level, both to you know hold down carbon emissions by a whole set of measures that look a little bit like flattening the COVID-19 infections curve, right? They have to come through government. 
and just like with COVID-19, a very aggressive effort to find new technologies, right? I mean, we saw with Operation Warp Speed what can be done if the government focuses an entire sector with direct R&D funding, with expedited approval processes, you know, with pre-orders, and then you get the ingenuity of the private sector focused especially on the challenges we need. But that requires the economics to make sense and to do that for climate in a way that addresses the problem that we need it addressed, it's going to require a push that looks very similar to what we did with COVID-19. Before we move to the hot seat, I'd like to return to Rumi because you're back leading Rumi now, have been for the last few years. That's your education technology nonprofit. What initiatives are you most excited about right now? One of the things that we pioneered during the pandemic that has done really, really well is something called microlearning. And so the idea is that anyone can learn on their phone or on their computer, but people don't learn in a digital manner the way they learn in the real world, right? In the real world, you're a captive audience and you're stuck in a classroom. And if the lecture is boring, you're stuck in you know, in lecture. If you're watching that same lecture on your smartphone in your bedroom and you're a kid, you're gonna switch to TikTok in five seconds if that lecture is boring, right? And if you're not thinking of it, I guarantee you TikTok's gonna send you a notification at exactly the right time because they're effectively good at hacking your attention. And so we had been working for years in uh, markets where people can only use basic mobile phones. And we had figured out that, you know, you need to build it for that form factor. And so we evolved towards five or six minute micro learning courses that are all mobile first and that have between 20 to 40 percent improvement in learning retention, which is incredible, but also is just more bite sized and that people use more. And so a lot of the data in the U.S. shows that people are actually taking time away from social media to use micro learning or, or bytes as we call them at roomy.org, which is great. But the second thing is that we're actually using it globally. And so today in local languages, Dari and Pashto, we actually have been uh, running, we started programs in 2017 and now we're scaling them up rapidly, programs in Afghanistan for girls and women's education. And it's extraordinary that if you have a country that has very little infrastructure, and on top of that, you have a situation on the ground now where culturally it's harder for women. It was already difficult for them, girls and women to, to learn, but you have a, an apparatus of mobile phones. And, and today over 80% of Afghans have access to a mobile phone. You have an ability to bring free learning to the people who are the most vulnerable in a way that is safe. It works from anywhere. It's free. Uh, and so that's what we've been doing in Afghanistan and are growing programs now for hundreds of thousands of women and girls who whose options to learn have suddenly been rapidly curtailed. And because we're working with the large mobile operator in the country, you know, we're just basically now sort of fundraising to grow content and distribution so that we can address a need that has spiked, you know, since the since the country unfortunately fell apart over summer. Absolutely. That sounds amazing. I really hope your technology solution can can overcome. The significant challenges that, that women and girls face uh, in, in Afghanistan. Well, we're almost done, but, but we have this tradition here at Climate Positive where we like to ask our guests a series of rapid fire lightning round questions. We call this the hot seat. The best feedback I ever rejected is? To blindly follow your passion. If I didn't follow that, I'd be trying out to play for Manchester United right now and f failing. So passion alone, sadly, wasn't, isn't always enough. You're a pragmatic idealist, right? Exactly. <laughs> Success is? I think it's around personal fulfillment and happiness. And I think, to be honest, that's always someone has to decide it for themselves. It can't be, you know, I found myself living someone else's dream for years. So I think it's very personal. I will never? Compromise values and integrity. I think we have to have something that we, that we believe in and focus on. Uh, and you can live comfortably while doing that. The most insightful book or article I read over the last month is? I'll say a recent book, because I'm not sure if I've had a chance to read a full book and then the last month, would probably be uh, Bob Schiller, The Economist's Narrative mm -hmm. Economics, which I read not long ago. And I, and I felt like um, influenced in some sense me trying to spark a debate around the narratives that underlie our economic system. Tupac or Biggie? I actually would go for Nas. But if I had to pick between those two, I would go for Tupac. And I have a strong preference for um, rappers who have a, a deep social or political viewpoint to share. Toronto, Silicon Valley, or New York? It's a tough one. I'm going to have to go with Toronto because I'm from the six and, you know, I'm loyal, even though I've, I've spent time living in all of them. And then to me, climate positive means? 
I think climate positive means that you're actually helping the climate, which means that you're net negative in the you know the sense of you're actually sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. I'm not sure if that's what everybody means. I mean, again, this is the challenge with all of these green terms, right? I mean, anyone can say whatever they want. <laughs> so like if you do the smallest thing, you're climate positive. But I think it ought to mean that you're actually contributing to you know reducing the problem rather than just not adding to it. Excellent. I think we definitely agree on that point. We do indeed. Tariq, you're an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, Tariq. It's been a really great discussion. Likewise. Great chatting with you both. Climate Positive is produced by Hannah Armstrong. Tell us what you thought about the conversation. You can send us show ideas by tweeting at us at Hannah Armstrong or send us a note at climatepositive at hannahnarmstrong.com. If you like the show, feel free to give us a rating or share with a friend. It helps others learn about the show and our climate positive mission. I'm Chad Reed, and this is Climate Positive.